yeah, if, if you don't mind me asking, what what is the thing that inspired you all of a sudden to want to learn logic anyway? Like, what's the what's the impetus for this? Um, I guess it was um, I thought it might help. I thought it might help um, because I found that when I was presenting my side to people or repeating their argument uh, to expose their contradiction, like they didn't grasp it and I thought maybe it was because of the way I said it or maybe I could have said it more coherently to them because I found myself with the last guy I debated um he repeating him repeating his position to him three times but I thought that if I just knew how to follow my thoughts more coherently maybe it wouldn't have taken that long mm. do you know what I mean Sure. So I thought maybe the logic would have helped with that. I don't know. I think you mentioned it to me once and you planted a seed and cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think that, I think people have this like misconception that, you know, logic is only useful if you want to have these like complicated ass, like philosophical discussions. And it's like, no logic just gives you a generally clearer thought process. It makes your thoughts clearer. It makes you able to better explain yourself, better understand what other people are saying. It's just like, generally useful we're just doing some like intuitive kind of thing in our head until we actually get some formal idea of how inference works yeah yeah now so, that sounds like it would be helpful hey i can't see you or anything um yeah that's I'm fine chat box. my camera's being used elsewhere you won't be able to see me you'll just be able to hear me oh cool okay no worries so basically i think we're gonna do this in sections um i don't think it'll take more than maybe like two or three like sessions for you to be like pretty comfortable with prop logic so today we'll just do one and i've got it divided into three kind of parts uh so we're gonna talk about validity and soundness we're gonna uh learn to read arguments when they're written in uh, a formal language uh the propositional logic formal language and we're going to learn to look at truth tables and determine if the argument's valid. So that's like the agenda for today. Oh, so cool. very, very start, like just kind of central concept in logic. Do you understand what validity and soundness are? I've heard you talk about it before, but um, I forgot. Okay, so validity, um, we would almost like, I, I, before I tell you what it is, it, this should be like the big, like focus a lot on this one. Cause validity is like what the whole kind of thing of what logic is about. Um, it's yeah. like kind of, if there's a central concept in logic, it's probably going to be validity. Okay, okay. So, so in fact, first of all, before talking about validity and soundness, let's talk about what those things apply to, which are arguments. Okay. So Here's another question. Do you understand in a technical sense, not in a colloquial sense, in a, in a technical logical sense, what an argument is? I'm going to say probably not, 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 not in its, uh, technical logical sense. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which it's, it's a funny question to ask because we argue all the time. So everyone kind of intuitively wants to go, well, of course I know what a an argument is but when we when we do get technical yeah it's important to know exactly what we're talking about so an argument is going to be just the this is all there is to it it's a set of premises and a conclusion that's what an argument is mm -hmm. so validity and soundness are properties that arguments can have so surely you have in your head that there is like there's good arguments and there's bad arguments right yeah well there's kind of technical understandings of what makes an argument good or bad so let's talk first about validity. Validity is a property of an argument, and it is the property of having a conclusion that follows necessarily from the premises. So that is to say, there is no way for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. An argument is valid if and only if the premises, if true, will necessarily lead to the conclusion. Do you okay. understand what I'm saying right now? Yeah. I'm going to be just checking with you a lot to make sure you're kind of following because some of this can be very weird when you first hear it. But so, uh, you know, just just let me know if you are or if you aren't. Okay. I'm just so, uh, writing down a few th key points. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the way I usually, if I teach something, do it is I make sure to go over until the other person can repeat it back and demonstrate like, yeah, cool. a, an understanding before we'll like build on it or try to go to anything more complicated. 
So try, just try to reiterate for me what validity is. Oh, shit, man. Yeah, you cut out um, at... We were talking about... Um, yeah. You said repeating um, to me and to understand that sure. part. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go through that. But also, if the internet is too bad, you know, just let me know. We can pick up another time. So, yeah, I was just saying, when I, uh, when I teach something, I just like to make sure the other person uh, understands it well enough that they can repeat it back in such a way that I go, yep, you understand, before yeah, adding cool. on more layers of complexity, right? Because then you get in okay, a situation yeah. where you're talking to someone and they're like, I think I know what's going on. That's the worst, right? So, fuck that. Okay, so validity. Do you think you can reiterate to me what validity is? Um, it's just, uh, that the premises, if true, would lead to the conclusion, like necessarily lead to the conclusion. So you're saying that, um, mm -hmm. they, that, yeah, like they, they would in theory sort of lead to the conclusion, not that they do. Yeah. Is that well, what you mean by that? Right. Well, yeah, you don't have to even say the part about in theory. You had it right, right at the start. It's that the premises necessarily lead to the conclusions. So to the conclusion okay. so why do you say way, necessarily because it's logically impossible for them not to that's what necessary means there okay we're, so we're gonna we're gonna look at that mathematically in a bit and you'll understand okay. why why it's impossible but just suffice to say for now validity uh is a property of an argument and it is the property of having a conclusion which follows necessarily from its premises uh, yeah. And all that necessary means there is that it's logically impossible for it not to follow. Okay. Okay. Um, so soundness is easier to understand. Soundness is just the combination of validity and true premises. So when you said validity is kind of about like in theory, it's like if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows. Soundness is like the next part of like the premises actually are true, right? I can give you a valid argument that's not sound, okay? So here's an argument which if its premises are true, the conclusion follows, but the premises are false, okay? Yeah. If Joey is a cat, then Joey is purple. Joey is a cat, therefore Joey is purple. That argument is valid. It's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false, but yeah. the premises are both false, right? It's not true that if you're a cat, you're purple. There's tons of cats that aren't purple, and it's not true that you're a cat. Yeah. So a sound argument is one that's valid, but it also has to have one other thing, which is true premises. So, yeah, just, just, uh, so an argument to, can be valid yeah. and not sound. Right. And can it be sound, but not valid? No. Right. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I think you're, you're following me so far. So we'll just, we'll just do a once over on this and then kind of move to the next thing if we're clear. Yeah. So just give me again, just what are validity and soundness? So validity is just basically premises that if true will lead to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that. Um, but they don't have to be true to be valid kind of thing. They just have yep. to logically lead to the conclusion. Um, mm -hmm. So you could make up two bullshit premises, and they could, but they could logically lead to the conclusion that would be valid. Um, mm -hmm. um, but soundness is the combination of it being valid with true premises, so that both the premises have to be true, mm -hmm. and um, it has to lead to the conclusion so it's a combination Perfect. of the both so validity can't be well validity doesn't necessarily have to be sound right uh but for it to be sound it has to be valid perfect yep you're yeah. awesome okay so now we're gonna move to the next thing um which is just reading arguments in propositional logic so i'm gonna teach you what the different symbols mean roughly at least what they translate into in english um, what they mean is going to involve getting into semantics, and we'll we'll talk about semantics in a next like session. Um, yeah. So I'm going to just tell you what the symbols mean, uh, such that you're able to look at any argument I type up in propositional logic, and you'll be able to look at the symbols and read to me what it says. Like P implies Q, P and R therefore Z, or whatever whatever it may say. Okay. Um, okay, so I want you to look at that realm of AY text channel, and I'm going to give you yep. some things, okay? So letters A through Z, we're going to say those are propositional variables. So all the letters, they're just going to represent propositions. Do you understand what a proposition is? 
not in the sense of logic. Um, okay, yeah. so you understand how there are, you probably understand what a statement is, right? Yeah. Yeah, statement is just we it's the same thing we learn in an English class in grade four. There's no logic meaning of statement here. We're just talking about statement normally. So, no. yeah, statement is just like a, basically just like a complete sentence. So, you know, the sky is blue. How are you doing today? That's a question, but I mean, you might say that's a kind of statement. Um, get over here. That's a statement. Now, <clears throat> propositions are a subcategory of statements. They are statements that have the property of being capable of being true or false. So they are statements with truth value. That's what a proposition is. So if I say something like, get over here right now, Joey, is that capable of being true or false? No. No, it's, it's a command. It's not, it's, <laughs> yeah, if I, it's if not I prop ask you, right, exactly. It's non-propositional, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, if I ask you, you know, how are you doing today? Is that capable of being true or false? No, no. If if I say the sky is blue, is that capable of being true or false? Yeah, you're proposing the sky is blue. Right, yeah. So people kind of get an intuitive sense of like, uh, once they kind of understand what the proposition refers to, it's pretty easy to spot out the propositions. Yeah. So we're yeah. just going to go through a few things and I'm just going to make sure you're able to separate which are and aren't propositions and then we'll move to the next, um, next uh, uh, bit of... Um, uh, nomenclature. So let's uh, let's do a few. So um, cats are cute. Proposition or not? Yeah, yeah. I think you're proposing cats are cute. So yeah. <laughs> Joey is a terribly mean activist who convinces nobody. Yeah, that's a proposition. Okay. Um, what time is it right now? No, that's a question. Then no, you're not proposing anything. So yeah. Lamp. No, it's just a noun. Um, okay, so I, I think I think you get the idea. <clears throat> so yeah, yeah. Proposition. Uh, if I ask you to define it, um, just as concisely as possible, what would you say a proposition is? I guess it's a statement capable of being true or false. Um, yep. And you, if you want, uh, in logic, they'll usually call that property of being able to be true or false having truth value. Um, and truth value is, this is a technical thing, you don't have to remember this, but it's a slightly better term because there are logics that allow for states other than true or false. Um, okay. you, you might have, like, that's a bivalent logic. Like, you know, when we talk about, like, a bifurcation or something, it's, like, split into two. Bivalent is when there's true or false. That's what we're going to work with right now. And, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people think, like, that's actually how things work. I can't really understand what it would mean for something to be to have a status other than true or false, but you know, for, forget about that for now. So, um, if you say truth value, though, that that captures whatever truth value it could have. So it doesn't assume we're talking about a bivalent logic. So it's better to say a proposition is a statement capable of having truth value, but it's also fine to say it's a statement capable of being true or false. No one's going to fucking dock you for that. Just a little technical point. Uh, okay. So yeah, you're right about that. Um, so when we use a letter in the nomenclature, and I guess I'll, I'll bring this up on screen so people can see what we're talking about. When we use a letter, like A through Z, it's just going to represent a proposition. So, you know, Joey is human, might be A, right? Um, you know, what was the other? Cats are cute, that might be B, right? So any proposition we can represent with a variable. Uh, you can't represent different propositions with the same variable or the same uh, proposition with different variables. That gets you into equivocation, um, where you're you're using you know diff it, well here, but let's not let's not worry about that right now. But you you get the idea. You can't use one variable for um, for multiple propositions. You can't use uh, you can't. Uh, sorry, you can't represent multiple propositions with the same variable. You can't represent the same proposition with multiple variables. It's so one yeah. variable, one proposition. That's how it works. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's go through the symbols. There's going to be, I think, what, like five or six that we'll use. So first of all, let's talk about the arrow. Um, so the arrow is implication. Um, so you can usually just write it as like implies. So we're going to understand technically and mathematically how these things work at a later point. But for now, again, the goal is just to understand just what they refer to in natural language. 
So natural yep. language is like our spoken language. This is a formal language that we're learning right now. There's natural language, okay. there's formal language, and then there's meta language, which is a language used to connect the formal and the natural language. But we also don't have to worry about meta language right now. So implication okay. is just implies. So let's say maybe I want to combine the two things I've just taught you. And maybe I, I want to write something like this. How do you think that reads without me telling you? So there are two propositions, and you're saying one proposition implies another proposition. Yeah, and which like, so proposition? P implies Q. Yep, yeah, but P, P implies Q, yeah. Right. Okay, uh, now let's, uh, let's do some more symbols. So the next is going to be the biconditional. So this is okay. basically just an implication that goes two ways. Uh, so you can, uh, let me just edit this so we can see what it says. We're going to call well, that... So, so Yep. So two propositions can imply each other. Yep, absolutely. So if you ever see that, um, it's just saying it's it's the same as so say that I write something like this, right? I say P by conditionally implies Q. That's the same yep. as saying P implies Q and uh, Q implies P. It's the same thing as saying that it's just condensed down. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, and biconditionals are not like they not are not used like kind of as often. Like the conditional is used way, way, way more than the biconditional. Um, okay. Okay. So now uh, let's do the next one. This is going to be called conjunction. Um, and they, all of these symbols kind of represent things that we say in natural language, right? So conjunction is just and. Yeah. So. Let's take two that are actually true. So Joey is sitting in a chair and Joey is thinking, right? There, I just gave you a, a conjunction, P and Q. Joey's in a chair is P, Joey is thinking is Q, and they're conjoined. So anything that you would say and. Yeah, yeah I mean, I guess an example was that was the other day I was watching a Arby uh, debate the guy after Vegan Gaines debated him and he was mm -hmm. doing multiple traits and he was just using conjunctive traits. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, that, and there's there's other options like, for example, the inclusive disjunction. So I'm gonna I've got to remember to write out what I want to write beside it before entering it. Uh, inclusive disjunction, which so sounds big and fancy, but it actually just means and or. So that's and or. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, if I say like I could just say I'm at home. Uh, you know, and or I'm playing guitar, right? So it's saying at uh, least one of those things is true. Either I'm at home or I'm playing guitar or I'm at home and playing guitar. It's pretty pretty obvious what and or means. It's just either of the things can be true or both can be true. It's only it's only false if both are false. Um, so that's that's pretty clear, right? And or. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, yeah. Okay, and then we're also gonna do the exclusive disjunction. Um, so, and a lot of the times, uh, people won't actually like use the exclusive disjunction. They'll just use other symbols to kind of get there. Um, but you know, whatever. Uh, the exclusive disjunction is just or. So you know, uh, I'm happy or I'm sad. So probably not mm -hmm. an actual exclusive disjunction because you know, I I could maybe be something other than just those two. But that's just an example, right? It's like one or the other. Not and or. Not and. Just or. Um, now there's one or two more symbols. Oops, that's first order logic. Okay, so here, this is another one. This is this is actually easier. This is uh, the negation symbol. So negation is actually probably the simplest one. Um, it just means not. <laughs> so if you put a negation before P, if I give you something like this, what do you what do you think that says? Well, you're negating a property, aren't you? Uh, Not a property. A proposition. A yeah. proposition. Sorry. Yeah, you're negating a proposition. Yeah. So how do how do you think it reads? If you're to translate. Not P. Into, yeah. Not P. Or it's not the case that P. Anything like that is a fine translation of a uh, negation. So. Uh, now, so like when you're saying P and not P. P or not P. Like, P and not P is going to be a contradiction. Uh, P P or not P. So. 
if, if you're going to say um if you're going to get someone to like contradict themselves you're saying you're saying this is this and not this at the same yes. time you can't Correct. you can't do yeah. that that's a contradiction so when you get them in a contradiction you're saying this and not this this can't yes. they can't coexist sort exactly. of thing. exactly and and you're yeah. going to be satisfied when we actually look at like the truth tables and stuff and you see and you get a technical mathematical understanding of what the problem is with with um contradiction or, or kind of what what it what it comes down to so yeah. now i'm going to give you a one more symbol this one is <laughs> means the same thing as it means when you use it in like a math proof or like in an essay or something teachers will write this but this is just the uh therefore sign so pretty pretty simple well that's just when you well, when would you use that at the end of it just indicates which is the conclusion uh-huh okay and a lot of people who like people who, who you know teach uh logic or work a lot with logic won't actually use the therefore sign but i find the therefore sign is very helpful just for people reading the argument who don't may not have like they haven't spent uh, you know much time with logic it's it's easy for them to go oh that's the conclusion right okay um so now now you know the vocabulary now there's there's basically going to be eventually mathematical descriptions of what these symbols mean they're not complicated uh the mathematical descriptions here are not going to be any harder than the kind of math you would do in high school um but for now all you need is just to know what they mean in natural language because now what i'm going to do kind of like what we did with propositions when i just asked you a bunch of things which are propositions and which aren't until it was clear that you could separate them uh i'm gonna give you arguments until you can just read them all using the above language and you can, okay. you can take your time because it's fresh in your head, right? So we'll write a few out here. So here's an argument. Um, why don't you give that a crack? It says P implies Q, P therefore Q. Correct. And that's actually one of the most common argument forms. That one's called modus ponens. You don't have to know the names. The names are kind of like, um, you know how in music there's kind of some standard like progressions like, uh, and we just put names on them because they're so common, like 12 bar blues. The names are kind of like that. You don't have to like know this is called modus ponens. That's not really like important. The important thing is kind of like knowing what it reads and if it's valid or not. But you know, there's a name for it for the record. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's do some more. Let's do... Um, How about that one? So that would be P and Q, R implies S, therefore not Y? Yep, yeah. I mean, so this part's... Well, how, how... So, okay, so all of those letters represent propositions. Yep. Yeah. yeah so this could uh, be... That, that, they're, they're just, you're just randomly assigning letters to different propositions so people can... There's some table with the proposition and the letter and then is that how you would do it? You would go, this is the proposition with a letter next to that proposition and then... We're going to um, get to the tables. The tables are... Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, I get it. I, I, yeah. Usually this is taught kind of from like the ground up, but the way I learned logic um, was actually starting with the tables, weirdly enough. So I, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I find it actually... I find a lot of people click if you get to the tables pretty quickly because then they kind of understand what the end goal is. So I'm going to... You're going to get to a point that you can read the tables and tell if the argument is valid before being able to generate the tables. The next one of these we do... I'm going to teach you kind of how to translate English into these sentences. You might already be able to do it, to be honest, from what I've shown you here, but we're going to make sure you can like do it clearly without like any any weird shit showing up. Okay. And we're going to teach you how to, how to generate the table from an argument like the one you just read. And then okay. uh, you'll you'll already know from today's session how to tell from that table if it's valid or not. Um, yeah. And this one, yeah, like this one is is just bullshit. This is definitely going to be invalid, and it'll be obvious if I if I give the proposition some like some names. So like here, the one above is kind of like the one I gave you with the cat, right? So P could be Joey is a cat, and Q is Joey is purple, right? This one you can kind of tell it's valid if I read through it. Although you'll be able to eventually see why it's valid mathematically. So P, so jo if Joey is a cat, implication then Joey is purple. Joey is a cat, therefore Joey is purple. Right, but if yeah. I read you this one, this one's just gonna seem like like insanity. Confusing, so yeah. like, 
Joey is a cat and Joey is purple. Um, stars are blue. Uh, sorry, if stars are blue, then um, Jesus is on fire. Therefore, it's not the case that Isaac is sitting at his computer right now. Like you can tell, yeah, they like, just, there's, yeah, they yeah, don't it, fit. It's like whatever propositions you put in there, it's just gonna. There's something very disconnected about that. It seems like it's obviously yeah. just like rambling insanity. Sounds like it's perspective yeah. philosophy talking or something. Okay, so here's um here's here's another one. So let's do um I don't know. Let's do um. How about that one? Okay, W or E. Um, therefore, not not P. There's a double yeah. negation there. Yep. Uh, wh why? A double negation actually will just come out the same as just saying P. Um, but I just wanted to make sure you didn't... The reason I put it there is just to make sure you wouldn't trip out when you read it. And you did fine. It's just not not P. Um, all okay. right. Let's do one more, and then we'll go to the tables. Um, so let's do, I don't know, like... Okay, there's one more. So Y and or W? Uh, w or X, therefore P, and that's a, con no, what was that called? A biconditionally implies Q. Yeah. So you would you would actually say P biconditionally implies Q. That's how you would read yeah, that. that that's like that's a good. fine way to that's a fine way to say it. Yeah. Do you have like a shortened version of um, biconditionally? Not, not they both the imply. <laughs> P both implies. Yeah, you can say no? P and Q imply each other. A anything, anything like that is fine. I mean, remember okay. when you put it into natural language, it's not as important to be rigid. Like, like you can read the implication as if P then Q. You can read it as P implies Q. You can read the biconditional as like P implies Q and Q implies P. Or like the natural language expression of it isn't um, doesn't have to be as rigid as the formal language. So like, if we were to write this out. There's like a bunch of expressions that we would kind of like translate into a given symbol. So when you translate out of the symbol to the language, there will probably be a range of ways you could express the symbol. So yeah, no, you're, you're doing fine. This is all good. So now, now you can read them. I'm sure you're still using this legend here that I've written up, but um, what you want to do kind of on your own time is just commit that to memory. <laughs> it'll, it'll probably oh, yeah, to that'll be take a bit of time. <laughs> I can't, I wouldn't be able to do that just yet. <laughs> that's that's fine though. It, it will go to memory actually just from working with the logic. It'll naturally happen, but you um, know you can. Uh, are more of these like uh, I'm guessing that more of these um are used more often than others and others are only included in specific like special scenarios or do you find these are mostly used like a lot of them are used a lot the you ones know what I'm that are to say? used the most are definitely implication uh conjunction and inclusive disjunction uh, oh uh yeah in implication conjunction uh, did i say negation negation is also obviously used all the time the uh, ones that are a little less common exclusive disjunction is a little less common and biconditional is a little less common i'm guessing negations are mostly used to point out the contradiction or um is that... not, not always like you might say like you know um well, I'm like a classic form that uses a negation is called modus tollens it's kind of like modus ponens so you say p implies q not q therefore not p so you could go like um if joey's laughing then joey is happy joey's not happy or sorry if joey's laughing then joey's ha happy joey's not happy so joey's not laughing um you could do something like that so the negation isn't actually in the conclusion there it's in the second premise but um it's just whenever you need to say something isn't the case Right? There's a okay. range of ways that can be used. I mean, obviously, this is kind of like a, a math almost that you're dealing with here. It's kind of like algebra. Like, There's a ton of ways to, to organize these things. It's not like negation is just going to be used in conclusions. But sometimes you'll get to a conclusion that's like, so it's not the case that, and then some proposition that the other guy believes. Okay. Um, okay, so 
Now what we want to do is we want to be able to read tables and determine if the argument is valid or not. So let's, uh, let's open up a table first of all. So we're going to do the table for modus ponens because again, it's just like one of the most common, it's, it's actually, I think it's the most common argument form. So this is just a function in the bot. You can obviously, you know, use the bot anytime if you want to find things out, but you can check arguments for validity. It's obviously telling us this argument is valid and uh, it'll generate a table. So what I want you now to do is open up that table and just tell me when you've got that open. Okay. 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 So I'm going to just walk you through what you're looking at on screen here. So <clears throat> there's two tables. There's a table for the variables and there's a table for the argument. Now, if you look at the argument, you'll see that there are two variables in this argument, right? You don't see any other letters than P and Q, correct? Yeah. Okay. So the variables table, what that is trying to do is capture every possible truth value for P and Q. So this should not be confusing, right? Um, say that you have two light switches, how many positions are there? Both on, both off, one on and the other off, the other on and the one off. It's the same yeah. kind of thing here, right? So with the propositions, both true, both false, or one true and the other false, or the other true and the one false. So what the ones and zeros represent in here are whether uh, the proposition in question is true or false. So. If you look at the variables table, um, in which row are P and Q both false? So zero is false, yeah? Mm -hmm. P and Q both false. Oh, so third, number three, hey? No. Um, no. Now I can tell you the answer, or I can let you figure it out here. Okay, let's have a look. Yeah, look at the variables table, not the argument table, just the variables table on the left. Oh, the, oh, number four. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah, number four, where they're both zeros. Where are they both true? Yeah, the top, number one. Right, exactly. And th so, and here's, here's another question. Is there any other possible option here? What do you mean? Well, could, could there be any other option than the four options here? No. No. <laughs> I mean, unless, <laughs> unless we make a more complicated logic and start adding other truth states, this is all you get. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. If yeah, every yeah, yeah. variable is either true or false, and there's two yeah, variables, yeah, there are four yeah. options. And you can, anyone yeah, yeah. who knows math, uh, okay, you, there's just an exponential function you can use to determine how, how many truth states are possible given a certain amount of variables. And we will get into that. Um, and it's not actually complicated. It's just a little equation. You just plug it in and then it gives you the answer. Um, so what we're trying to do here, I want you now to reflect on what validity is. Um, so validity is when it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So what's happening with the truth table is we're capturing every possible truth state of the variables. And we're seeing if under any of those conditions, we're going to get the premises coming out true and the conclusion coming out false. Now, normally people wouldn't be presented with a table like this quite this early. They'd know how to kind of fill it out before getting it. But I, for some reason, I just find it works a bit better to teach it this way. Maybe I'm crazy. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's a way to look at a statement like P implies Q. If you look in the premises column of the argument table, you'll see there's the first premise, P implies Q. Are you looking at the same place as me? Yeah. Now, there's actually a way via tables. There's kind of a little mathematical thing behind it, which you'll understand. Uh, we'll do that, I guess, the next time we talk. It, that will allow you to fill in a table like this. So in time, you will learn how to generate the table, how to tell how big it needs to be, and how to fill it out. Um, but right now, again, we're not worrying about that. So what we want to see is if there's any case where the premises are true and the conclusion false. What, what would that look like here, given that we represent true as one and false as zero? Yeah, it would have to be um, the, the premises are uh, true and the conclusion is false, did you yeah. say? 
Yeah, that would be an invalid argument. So I'm, I'm asking, what would it look like on the table if the argument was It would invalid? have to... Well, it'd have to be... Um, wouldn't it have to be all zeros? No, that, that would be just saying that everything is always false. That's not quite saying it's invalid. So try, try to... Try to think of the definition of validity, right? Premises true, conclusion if false. true. And we know okay. true is one and false is zero. Ah, oh, well, so yeah, it's just the, like the the bottom one, right at the bottom here. Mm, well, no. The premise is true. Um, well, there's one premise true, but the other premise is false. If you're looking at the very bottom row. Ah, uh, so these two, they're both. So P implies Q and P. So I'll, I'll tell you how this one works. Um, sometimes I just ask questions to get someone's like mind working a bit. Well, on wait it. a second. Um, Cause in the, in the third one down, it's they're both P implies Q is false. Mm -hmm. P is true. So that's not a case where both premises are true, right? For invalidity, we need a case where both mm. premises are true and the conclusion is false. So what that will look like if an argument is invalid, there's going to be at least one row in the argument table, not the variable table, in the argument table where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So as in, you see two ones, you see ones for and all one premises, zero. and you see a zero for the conclusion. Oh, now, yeah. Well, I, I, I thought you meant... <laughs> I thought you meant look at this table and look for two true premises and, and, a, and I was like, wait, there isn't one. No, that, on and, and, okay, well, if you jump to that, then that's great because that's, that's the point. That's why the argument is valid. There is no such row, right? It's, and this is what I meant by mathematically impossible. There, there is just no case in the table where you have true premises and a false conclusion. Because of how we've defined our symbols, it's just impossible within this logic for that to be the case. Yeah. So what you want to do just in order to read the truth table, again, we're not worrying about generating it, in order to read it and tell if the argument is valid, you just want to see if there is any row, a single row, because a single row means the argument's invalid. It doesn't have to be every row, just one, right? Because remember, each row just captures what the argument evaluates to under some possible truth state for the variables, right? So like the first row of the argument column, it corresponds to the first row of the variable column. That's how the argument evaluates if P and Q are both true. The second row, of the argument column. Again, same thing. It corresponds to the second row of the variables column. That's how the argument will evaluate if P is false and Q is true, right? So if the argument's invalid, there's going to be at least one row in the argument table where you have ones for all premises and a zero for the conclusion. You following me so far? Yes. That sounded a bit hesitant. Is something tripping you out? Yeah, what's the argument table? The argument, so you see how there's two tables here? There's one that says variables, and then there's this other one here that's yeah, got prem premise, one with premises, premises and... Yeah, because remember, an argument is just premises and a conclusion. Premises, okay. Right, so the argument table is this one. It's the one with uh, premises and conclusion. Yeah, just... and the variables is this one here. Yeah, yeah, variable table, argument table. Correct. So, again, for an argument to be invalid, forgetting about the variables table, if it's invalid, you will look at the argument table and you'll see that, that there is at least one row where the premises have ones and the conclusion has a zero. That yeah. means it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Um, now, we can go over this as many times as you want. Does that seem clear? Does that seem confusing? Yeah, because like, as soon as I start seeing numbers, I start getting tripped up. All right, so obviously premises... Um they have to be true uh, for it to be valid. So it has to be no. true. Remember? No? Remember? Oh, they, no, no, that, that's soundness. If right. true. Yeah, they just so have to maybe be I premise. Should... Well, and, and that's why we've mapped out all of the possibilities for, for whether the variables in the argument are true or false, right? Because when we're talking about an argument's valid, if it's an argument where the premises, the if true, lead to the conclusion. We're just going to look at all of the possible truth values for the variables, and we're going to see where the premises come out true, and we're going to see if any of those cases where the premises come out true are cases where the conclusion comes out false. And we'll just look at a few of these until you're comfortable with it. I'm so, gonna... so can you just explain the second mm -hmm. line here? Um, P implies Q, okay, true. Mm -hmm. uh, P, false, conclusion, yep. true. Yep. 
So how is that? Well, that's that's going to get into how we actually read the argument, um, and and how how we how we assess the truth value. Okay, I the, get it. Yeah. Okay, now you're saying that the zero means that the um, the premise isn't true, like I'm purple or something, but mm -hmm. the conclusion is still um, it still leads to the conclusion. Yeah, I mean, it should be obvious. It's possible for me to give you a premise that has, like, a true implication. No truth, like, no truth. you know, if Joey's a cat, mm -hmm. then Joey has feline DNA, right? There's P implies mm -hmm. Q being true. Joey is a cat, okay. there's P being false. And Joey, yeah. well, it's not the case that you have feline DNA, so that one didn't work out. But but the point, the point should still be obvious, okay? Of course it's going to be possible to have some kind of argument where you get one premise coming out true, the other coming out false, and the conclusion coming out true. Sometimes the conclusion is true, but it's just not a valid argument, right? Like, I can give you an invalid so, argument with the true conclusion. So, P can be false, but still imply Q. Yes, absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. so now I'm following you now that I'm just thinking about thinking this through and just getting my head into it. Um, yeah, I mean, if Joey's God, then Joey can... If, throw thunderbolts or something right like, well it's like yeah it's yeah, true yeah. that if you were god you'd be able to throw thunderbolts but it's not true that you're god <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, okay now, uh, this is going to take me to like because i'm seeing this in a table like when we when you explained it to me without this table and then i saw the table and then it started to you know what i mean like i need to uh, I think it's something i need to go over and go over yes. and go over well, yeah, so this is this is all we're going to do today, actually, is just clarify this part. Um, so I'm just yeah. going to keep bringing up arguments until you can just comfortably, just like you're kind of doing with the symbols, until you can just comfortably look at it and say whether it's valid or not. Um, mm -hmm. So let's do another. So I'm going to go back to uh, go back to realm of AY, and we're going to do a different argument. So let's do P implies Q. Let's go Q, and then let's go therefore P. Um, so you'll see uh, a different table here, and if you can just open that one up and tell me when you've got it open. Okay, here we go. Bad argument. So a few things you should, like, the first thing you should notice is, again, it's just a two variable argument, so you're going to just get the same kind of variables table. There's no difference in the variables table. There's just four conditions. P and Q can both be true, both be false, or one true and the other false. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that <laughs> the glaring red color is kind of standing out, which makes it a little, a little cheap. <laughs> so <laughs> I wish I could temporarily turn that off so that I could, I could make someone work for it to determine if it's invalid or not. But you can surely see what's up here, right? There's a row where the premises are both one and the conclusion is zero. Yeah. So we can tell that yeah. this argument is invalid. There's some kind of form problem. So, yeah, they're, they're both true, but they don't lead to the conclusion. Yeah, so here's, here's, like, here's um, an argument that's in this form, okay? So let's say P is I'm at Walmart and Q is I'm not at home, okay? So mm -hmm. if I'm, uh, sorry, if I'm at Walmart, then I'm not at home. I'm not at home, therefore I'm at Walmart. Something should immediately seem really fucking weird about that to you, just without even thinking about the math or anything. If I just say that sentence to you, forget the logic for a second and just lis listen to me speak that sentence, okay? If, if I'm at Walmart, then I'm not at home. I'm not at home, so I'm at Walmart. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're at Walmart, does it? Obviously, of course, because all, all we know is that being at Walmart implies not being at home. It's not a biconditional. It's not that being no. at home implies being at Walmart, right? So yeah, we've, yeah, kind yeah. Of, we've kind of abused the conditional here. We've almost treated it as if it's a biconditional, but there's no implication going in that direction from Q to P, right? So yeah. Yeah, so that's just a natural language version. And again, we'll as we do more of this, we'll use like some natural language sentences and tie them to the propositions, and that will start making like making it all very clear. But yeah, what you should be noticing right away is just all you want to do, Joey, when you look at the when you look at an argument's truth table to determine if it's valid or not, just look at the you see how there's premises and conclusion column. Just look at the yeah. premise columns, see look at any row where they're all ones. 
and see if for any of those rows where they're all ones, there's a row where the conclusion is a zero. Yeah. Okay. That's invalid. Of course. Yeah. Because it's so, and, and here's an additional thing. Okay. The row where it's invalid, we'll call that the counter example. Have you ever heard that word counter example? No. So a counter counter example, when we use that term in logic, it just refers to, um, a, a truth state for the arguments variables where, uh, we get the premises being true and the conclusion false. So it's like the row that demonstrates invalidity is the counter example. So what we'd say here is that we have a counter example when P is false and Q is true. Can you see why that is? Or is that still sounding a little, little weird? That's still sounding a little weird. That's okay. So if you look at that row of the truth table, where we have, mm -hmm. uh, where we have the counter example, look at the variables column. What are the truth yeah. values for the variables? P is false, Q is true. So there is a counter example when, um, just what you just said. P is false and Q is, wait, so wait a yeah. second. If P is false and Q is true, the premises of this argument evaluate to true and the conclusion evaluates to false. That's the counter example. The counter example is when P is false and Q is true. Okay. And please ask questions at any point. Like this is now that it's getting, you know, there's math and there's a table and shit. Um, I wasn't ever very good at math. That's okay, man. It's, it's going to be fine. Um, <laughs> it feels like <laughs> when you say it's going to be fine, it sounds like we're about to endure like torture or something. So no, um, no, no. Cause I think like I get where this is going. Cause it's going to help, um, you know, coherently pick out these things when you're using natural language and, and then, oh, yeah. you know, formulate arguments, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I can see how this can be helpful, but yeah, once you develop a base level of competence with logic, you will just immediately, it's like putting on like goggles into like how bad everyone is thinking all the time. <laughs> you'll just, you'll just notice like everyone is constantly just making these weird jumps and you can't understand like how they're getting from A to B or from P to Q. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm just going to generate a few more and, uh, you know, I think that'll pretty much be it for this session. And then, you know, next time we'll yeah. do some stuff about, about actually generating the tables and filling the yeah. tables. Cause right now you wouldn't just... know how to generate or fill a table right now. We're just trying to get you to a point that you can read the table for the feature of validity or invalidity. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think I'm quite there yet with these tables. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. There's something about it that's making me, um, like making my brain frizzle. That's okay, um, man. Well, I mean, you probably haven't done math since like fucking high school or something, right? I don't, I, I was actually kicked out of my maths class in high school. I had to sit <laughs> outside for like yeah. a year. <laughs> it, if it's, if it's helpful, you can think of the zeros as Fs and the ones as Ts. Like it just means true or false. But yeah, like, yeah. Uh, honestly, part of it is just exposure. You just have to see a bunch of them and it becomes more clear. Yeah. I'm going to generate one that's a little more complicated now. Um, so let's do, uh, let's do P implies Q, Q implies R, therefore P implies R. So let's open up that one. Oh, so the bot is actually reading your equation here. And generating the table. Yep. <laughs> what? <laughs> so you might oh, notice... Oh, so you get people to <laughs> to write these out like this, and then the bot goes, okay, let's see if this is valid. <laughs> well, I mean, I try to... I usually just help someone find a valid form, right? But when someone is, like, insisting their argument works and it's not valid sometimes it's necessary to just like generate a truth table for it and just be like look it just doesn't it doesn't work okay there's <laughs> you can't you can't wow. use this um Epic. yeah because the thing is when we're not actually using any logic we're all just kind of intuitively going does that make sense does that make sense if someone's insisting that their inference makes sense, it can be hard to explain exactly why it's wrong. And most people have a temptation to kind of go after the premises. But you, you can have problems there because you can you can have 
you know, cases where, like, the, well, let's, whatever, I, I don't want to get confusing, but, like, you, sometimes you want to be able to show that it's not the falseness of, like, this premise or that premise or even the conclusion, it's how you're getting from A to B that's the problem. It's the form of the argument that's the problem, right? So if you're just having a natural language conversation with someone and they're giving you an invalid inference, it can be very hard to tease it out or to make them appreciate it, right? But if you just go, okay, look, I'm going to formalize what you're saying. I'm going to put it into a formal argument and we're going to see how it pans out. Then usually you can just kind of show the problem like mathematically, which is helpful. Yeah. So this Sorry. table might look a little more ominous, but it really shouldn't be. Like, so you can tell it's a bit bigger. Let's look just at the variables table right now. It should be obvious why it's bigger. It's bigger because there's another letter now. We've got P, Q, and R, right? <clears throat> so if you look at the variables table, if you have if you have three light switches, there's actually not going to be, uh, you know, just just four kind of potential positions they can have relative to each other, right? You could have uh, you could have light switch, you could have all the light switches on, you could have the first off and the second two on, you could have the first on, the second off, and the third on, you could have the first two off and the third on. You can tell that there's a lot more options once you add in another variable, right? Yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah of course, okay. Um, so, again, just like with the last one, is there any row where the premises are true and the conclusion is false? No. No, no, there's not, right? And I, I just want to make sure that we're, we're looking at it in the same way to determine that. How, how did you determine that? I just looked for two ones and one zero at the end. And where did you look for two ones and where did you look for the zero? In the, yeah, look for, make sure the premises were true and the conclusion was true. Right. Okay. No, you, so I don't know why you said you're tripping out at this. I just gave you a more complicated one and you figured it out easily. So yeah, there's no, there's no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But okay. No... So let's, let's look at this then. So this argument is deductively valid. So you've got one here where P implies Q is false. Q implies R is true, but the conclusion is still true. Can you give me an example of how that would happen? Well, I mean, I, I would have to think up like an argument uh, and that would take me sitting here for a minute trying to go, okay, what are some propositions that in actual reality we can have them be true and then a conclusion? So I can, uh, okay. if, if you want, I'll, okay, do, yeah, I'll yeah. come up with a few examples like that, but that, that will So they just have to be stating a falsehood, thinking. like some type of falsehood. Um, like they could say, uh, you know, animals are fine with dying. So if they are fine with dying, therefore it's okay to kill them. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, yeah, that's like modus no, ponens. If animals are fine with dying, it's okay to kill them. Animals are fine with dying, therefore it's okay to kill them, right? So the second premise is false, and the conclusion is false. But you could make one, like, you just have well, to sit there and think for a minute, and you can come up with one where it'll be like, oh, this premise is false, but the conclusion is still true, or that premise well, is say, false, but... Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd say the first premise is false because they're not fine with dying. <laughs> yeah, they're, <laughs> they're not fine with dying. <laughs> and, and you can tell that that cripples the inference, right? Because if that premise is false, then there's no way that we can't get to the conclusion just by saying, if they're okay with dying, or sorry, yeah, what was it? If if what what was the exact sentence you gave there? I forgot it already. I said yeah, animals are fine with dying. They're, oh, so it's okay. So, to we, so if they're fine with dying, then it's okay to kill them. Right, exactly. Um, so, obviously, if we take away the premise that it's actually the case that they're fine with dying, then we can't just derive the conclusion by saying, if they were fine with dying, it would be okay to kill them. So the, the argument's valid, but it's not sound because right. one of their premises is false, so... Yep. Yep, soundness just requires one false premise. They don't have to both be false, and the conclusion can still be true, even, and it can be unsound. So we just go, well, wait a second, one of your premises is completely false here, you know? Yeah. And then you'd, exactly. you'd attack that. Yep. And um, you, you don't always have to... Here, this is just a technical point for debate. This isn't that like super yeah. relevant to the stuff we're doing right now. But you don't have to go all the way to your premise is false. You can just say, I don't see a reason to accept that as true. Right? Because sometimes you're not going to know how to falsify a premise. Like, in that case, it's easy. You're like, well, I mean, of course I can give you a good reasons to think animals don't want to die. But sometimes someone will give you a premise 
that you can't actually tell why it's false, right? You don't have a way to falsify it, but you're not convinced it's true. And at that point, it's fine to just be agnostic and say, okay, well, I'm just not convinced this premise is true, and then request a supporting argument. And then they have to give you an argument where the conclusion is what was the premise in the argument you were analyzing. So maybe they give you an argument and one of the premises is like P, animals are fine dying. You don't accept that, but say that you don't go as far as to actually reject it. You're like, I'm just not convinced it's true. You'd want them to give you a supporting argument where the conclusion is P. Instead of P being a premise, that's actually the conclusion. So they'd support it somehow. Somehow support their premise with another yeah. argument. Yeah. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. And the idea is somewhere, somewhere, eventually, if they keep supporting the premises for each argument, they've got to bottom out at propositions you actually agree with. And if they can't do that, they're not going to persuade you. But it, yeah, yeah, once you can stack arguments together, then you get in this really nice space where like when someone's trying to convince you of something, you can just formalize, you can just, at, if you're not convinced of a premise, you can just ask for the proof of the premise, they give you another argument, and you can just kind of like burrow down into the inference structure until you hit something that you can clearly falsify, or until it just becomes obvious that they can't bottom out anywhere in premises that they can prove. They just kind of keep giving you more premises they can't prove, and they're nev never able to ground it. Yeah. Yeah, but that, yeah. that's a bit yeah. further along, but that's like, that's what I kind of think of as like Rolodexing. Like I've talked about that in my like uh, debate tips videos, because that's how you just kind of, you have a proposition in focus and you just like navigate through their inference structure and just, you know, test. What are each, inferences? You know. What are inferences like in, to infer something? Um... Oh, it's just another word for an argument. It's, it's just like you're inf inferring is, is just like, it, uh, I mean, you could use a word like deriving. I can only really give you synonyms, but it's like reaching the conclusion. Like in an argument, we infer the conclusion from the premises and the argument okay. is an inference. Yeah, so the conclusion follows from the inference. It's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, the conclusion is part of the inference. It's inferred from part of the, the premises. It's inferred from the premises, okay. And it's pretty close to how we use it in natural language. Like if, you know, like, some guy's wife comes home like i don't know with like i i, I or no so yeah husband it's easier with husband comes home with like lipstick marks or something on him right the wife might infer that he was cheating right and the idea mm -hmm. of inference is like she somehow got from some premises to a conclusion there right it's like if he has lipstick marks then he was with another woman he has lipstick marks so he was with another woman like there would be some kind of inference it's not formal like that in her head because she's not like writing out syllogisms for how her husband cheated but there's a kind of intuitive type of inference happening in the head in the mind of her right there right she's that'd be an getting... interesting relationship wouldn't it getting out the <laughs> truth tables <laughs> it's like it's like look falsify that <laughs> uh, well <laughs> god <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I might be able to deal with a girl like that, but um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know if, if most would. Let's do a, let's do a few more. Um, so let, let's see. Check. Um, let's do P or let's do yeah. Let's do P and or Q. Not P. Therefore, Q. So you've probably seen, there's, there's some forms, again, kind of like I said with music, they're just so common, we use them already, that they kind of get names, like 12 bar blues, it's like, it's just such a common progression that we just call it something. So this one's called disjunctive syllogism, it's really, really common. Um, it, I mean, if I say, like, look, either you're an animal abuser or you're a vegan, you're not a vegan, so you're an animal abuser. You, you use that all the time. That's a disjunctive syllogism. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're saying it, either it's A or B, and it's not A, so it's B. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Inclusive disjunction, okay. Yeah, inclusive disjunction is used in the first premise, but the actual name of that argument is disjunctive syllogism. You don't, again, don't worry about memorizing the fucking argument names. I'm just kind of making a point that... A lot of the you're either P that, or Q. If you're not yeah. P, then you're Q. Yeah. Yeah. I, exactly. And and you don't have to remember that that's called disjunctive syllogism. You probably will eventually if you spend enough time with logic, because you'll just hear people say, "Oh, disjunctive syllogism." Um, but the uh, 
the point I was making is just that, like, this is already something you literally are doing, right? Like, you, you yeah, literally yeah. make, you don't always lay it out, like, either it's this or that, it's not this, so it's that. Often in natural language, we kind of skip a premise. You're just like, you know, like, either you're an animal abuser or a vegan, right? Or like, we might, but the, the, this is the inference behind it, is the idea. So I'm just trying to capture yeah. the fact that, like, you're already doing this, but when you can formalize it and understand it mathematically, you know, there's another, it's helpful. Oh, that's yeah. so helpful. Yeah. <laughs> because there's a reason why, like, I'm pointing out logical contradictions, but I'm not aware of them, uh, as aware of them as I could be. If I was a, as aware of them as I could be, it would be I'd be much uh, much stronger, um, because mm -hmm. then I could follow what they're saying more co coherently and follow m what I'm saying more coherently. Because sometimes I'm just, mm -hmm. sometimes I look because I get a bit emotional as I do, you know me. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I just feel like I'm spraying in the wind a little bit, like when I could like, <clears throat> if I hone in on these things, they're sure. going to flow much better, and they're going to understand, you know, much better. Well, some people just don't understand, no matter what you say. But yeah. You know, I think sure. it will help a lot. Sure. I mean, when it comes to activism and like how you employ this, like I'm not, I doubt you'll be out on the streets going, going like, well, in the first column of the truth table for the statement you just made, like no one's going to like, that's, I mean, it's probably not going to be a, an effective thing to do, but the, the kind of what it will do for you is you'll just have way more clarity. It's the same as like understanding, you know, the philo like philosophy, first of all, it kind of includes logic. Philosophy is usually metaphysics, epistemology, logic, and ethics, right? Those are kind of the main like, like things in philosophy. But in the same way as it's useful to understand some of the like kind of more complicated philosophy behind veganism, that's useful for activism, not because you're going to be sitting there you know, using words that these people have never heard, like deontology, consequentialism, particulars, like, it's not that you're actually going to use those words all the time when you're advocating. Maybe some will get a showing here or there. It's just that you have a way clearer model, and it helps you navigate the conversation better. It's the same kind of thing with logic. It's like, it's good to understand the philosophical ideas behind something, makes the whole conversation clearer, makes it easier to follow. It's good to understand the inference structure behind things. Same kind of deal. Yeah. No, yeah. I agree. Yeah. So yeah, let's just look at a few more. So here's disjunctive syllogism. So again, uh, is there any row where the premises are true and the conclusion false? Oh god, I just I just do good out of him. One sec. Where is he? Okay. Okay, now it's this one. Boom boom. Yeah, it should be P uh, or uh, P and or Q, not P therefore Q. Okay, yep. Here we go. So what did you say? I'm just asking if it's valid or not. Okay, is there any row where the premises are true and the conclusion's false? Is there premises a counter true. example? No. No, right? So there's, there's none. There's only one row where both premises are true. It's row two, and the conclusion's true. Yeah. All right, let's just do one or two more. Um, I'm going to generate you a big one. See, I'll see if I can make one come up that has multiple counter examples. Um, I don't know if I can actually do that. It's kind of hard to picture them. Um, let's see. Um, um, uh, okay. So here's another one. If you want to open that one up. Now, for the record, eventually when these get complicated enough, you can tell the truth table's kind of getting exponentially bigger the more variables we add. You don't usually need an argument with this many variables, but there are other logics that uh, you can use when the tables get too big for propositional, uh, for these so kind of this, like prop logic truth this, tables. This table, right, mm -hmm. like it's giving it every single variable of the possible and um mm -hmm. if there's even a few of these variables that are wrong then that means a bad argument if there is a so single one if there's a single one but you should see there's actually three counter examples here so yeah. there's there's a counter example when p is false q is true r is false s is true x is true and z is true right and there's going to be other counter examples too and again, you, you understand what I'm telling you, the counter example, all I'm doing is reading the truth values in the variables column beside the red mm. line, beside the, the line that shows the arguments invalid. I'm just looking mm. at 
what what truth conditions for the variables produce that kind of state of affairs. Um, so again, it's it's obvious, but valid or invalid? Yeah, invalid. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, yeah. P in plus uh, S in plus X, Q and Z. Yeah, it's like it's just a ton of disconnected statements, basically. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's like I like this argument could just read something like, you know, <laughs> here this is one where we could easily make um, the premises true and um the conclusion false uh so what well obviously so let, I, I can give you something in natural language like if joey is uh talking to me right now then joey is using his voice maybe that's p implies r s implies yeah. x you know if the earth is orbiting if humans still exist on the earth the earth is orbiting the sun so that maybe that also and uh you know if Isaac is teaching Joey logic, then Isaac has some basic understanding of logic. Oh, sorry, that's that's an and. That's not an implication, sorry. So yeah. Isaac is teaching Joey logic, and Isaac understands some basic logic, right? So those are those are all true premises, but there's just, there's just no fucking connection between them. There's no shared variables yeah. between them. So it's very easy for them all to be true, and then the conclusion to be false. And the conclusion also isn't, like, tied to any of these. I don't even think... Oh, no, there is an R in one of the premises, but... Yeah, so I think I think that you probably, as far as I can tell, you seem to get the idea. I mean, don't mm. you, surely you feel pretty comfortable that you can just look at a table like this and just see if there's any row where the premises have ones and the conclusion has a zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think honestly that uh, for now that might be all we'll do. Um, you can you now. Although you will need to kind of, you might need to memorize those things. You're able to read. First of all, you know what validity and soundness are. Um, yeah. You, I mean, in fact, let's just let's just recap that. You remember what they both are? Uh, validity is um, two premises. Um, doesn't have to that, be two. Th sorry, doesn't, doesn't have, have to be, to be true. Two. You, you no two premises that. Ah, uh, okay. So no, an argument yeah, just... have like fifty premises if you wanted. The oh, so to be valid. It to be valid, the premises, uh, the conclusion have to follow from the pre premises sort of thing. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. They, don't, they don't have to be necessarily true, right. um, but they just have to be logically consistent. And yeah, the, the easy way to say it, just you might want to just memorize the sentence because what you're saying is right, but there's an easier way to say it. It's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. That's what validity is. Okay. Yeah, but you, what you're saying is correct. It's just more roundabout. And then soundness is... It's a combination of um, true premises and validity. So, Correct. yep, yeah. So yeah, so we've been through validity and soundness. You understand what they are. We've yep. been through reading arguments. Um, so now, although you probably need to look at the nomenclature until you actually kind of have it in your head, you're able to look at them and read them. You know, like if I ask you mm. to read this argument right here, in fact, that we've just generated, are you able to read this? Yeah, P implies R, S implies X, Q and Z, therefore R. Yeah, exactly. I don't think you even looked at the fucking nomenclature there, did you? No, yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. so it's all Yeah, it's it's ingredient. getting there. It's like, then you've got not P, and therefore R. Like, there's only yeah. a few here. Um, yeah. Conjunction is up. Disjunction. Yeah, inclusive disjunction. Yeah, I reckon that'd be pretty easy. Then you've got by conditionally um, implies. Mm -hmm. um yeah, there's not that many of them to remember, really. So, yeah, I don't... No. <laughs> and and no. sometimes there's one or two more that get used, but they're, like, derivative symbols, kind of like in some of the sciences. You'll have, like, derivative mm -hmm. units, which are just, the, like, combinations of other units together. So some, yeah. sometimes there's, like, NAND and NOR, but, like, really, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't fucking matter there because they can still... You can still do the same things with the symbols I've given you. Um, and... Yeah most people don't even like use them like when i will talk with people who actually are logicians or have like like lots of formal training here like they're not like oh it's vital to like know the nand operator or something like yeah so anyway so you know what validity is you know what soundness is you're able to look at the arguments and read them although again pro probably you need to commit a bit of that to memory but s certainly when you have the nomenclature chart you're able to do it and you seem to be able to do a lot of it without having the nomenclature chart and uh, you know how to actually look at the table and determine if the argument is valid or not. So this is all really good. 
And then next time, I think what we'll do is I'm going to show you how to translate natural language sentences into arguments. Um, so if I say like, you know, if Joey's at home, Joey's near his computer, you know, uh, I'm at Walmart, therefore Joey's like on a bobsled, like we're going to make sure that you can take something like that and translate it into an argument. And <laughs> so we're going to do natural language translations. Um, and then we're also going to do, this is kind of the most important part, and this will be kind of like the final thing to, to have just a good general understanding of logic, of, of propositional logic. We're going to do how to generate the truth table. Because right now you know how to read it, you know how to read the argument, you know what it's getting at, but you don't know how to generate it. You don't know how to look at a bunch of, you don't know how to look at an argument like this written in, you know, prop logic algebra nomenclature and then generate a table from it you'd know how to read the table if it were generated but you don't know how to generate it so yeah next time we'll do natural language translations and generating truth tables yeah that'll be good man i think the natural language thing will help me understand these but i think they all fuse in together don't they yeah then you start yeah. to see things not just mathematically but how it fits into you know when you actually put it into action sort of thing yeah, and you're you're a quick study, especially for someone who uh, doesn't have like really even like high school like math, as far as I understand. So, yeah, yeah. like you're uh, you're doing great, and I think it'll be helpful for you. And I think it's really good that you're uh, you know interested enough to put in the time. Yeah, I will. I will. I'll start like because I have been really rattling these things over in my mind, and um, I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement for me. So yeah, this will be good. Fucking A. Okay, I'm gonna stop the uh, recording part here.